Hello. Okay, let's try again. Hello. Hello. Okay, perfect now. I'm Stefano Mostarda, and I'm here today to talk about uh, TypeScript. So uh, let's start with a question. How many of you know TypeScript? Who has no idea of what TypeScript is? <laughs> okay, uh, we don't have, we have very little time, just 20, 25 minutes, so a uh, very tight schedule. Um, I'll try to introduce briefly what, uh, what TypeScript is, uh, and then uh, we'll go straight to the demo. Uh, I, often, I often heard that a definition of TypeScript. TypeScript is JavaScript on steroids. To me, uh, that's um, not the right definition of TypeScript, because type is, TypeScript is multiple things. It's a language. It's based on JavaScript, which means that 100% of JavaScript code works with TypeScript. It's a transpiler, because it's a language with, uh, that lets you write code um, using ES6 and ES7 features and uh, it transpiles your code in uh, ES5 or ES3, whatever you want. But it's, uh, it is also a compiler. W uh, what I mean by compiler? TypeScript um, is called TypeScript because it adds strong typing to JavaScript. You can have uh, a variable, you can declare a variable and say, hey, it's a string, it's a number, it's a Boolean. It's a custom class that you can create in TypeScript. But and uh, if you create, if you declare that a variable is a string, you cannot assign a number, a Boolean. If you declare a function which takes a parameter that is a string, you cannot pass a number, a Boolean, or a custom class that you can create. You can only pass a string, and that um, that constraint is enforced at compile time. You cannot compile. Of course, this is just TypeScript magic. When it transpiles to JavaScript, uh, all this typed stuff goes away. You have plain JavaScript. But this kind of this feature, strong typing, is what makes type TypeScript extremely useful and powerful. Because the lack of typings is what makes JavaScript a real nightmare sometimes. Very, very error prone. So that's why I say that TypeScript is a transpiler, a language, and a compiler. Because at compile time, you get strong type checking. The compiler is a service. What I mean by service? Um, that whatever IDE you use, uh, I will use Visual Studio Code. But um, you can, uh, we'll see if we have time that you can, we can have the same experience with uh, um, a JavaScript page, with an HTML page, uh, us uh, using Visual Studio or WebStorm. The compile, you can, um, the ID can query the compiler and uh, obtain information uh, about errors, about mm, suggestions, how to complete, while you write. While you're writing code, the ID can query the compiler and say, hey, is there any error in the code the developer is writing? If the compiler say, yes, this is the error, the ID, while you are writing, can tell you, hey, you are writing something wrong. You are doing something wrong. Uh, of course, uh, this also improves uh, the possibility of uh, refactoring. There, are, there is a lot of stuff that you can do with strong typing and with the compile as a service with TypeScript. So, I've been talking for about three or four minutes. F 
for those of you who don't know what TypeScript is, do you like TypeScript? Just hearing what I said. Okay. Uh, I hope there was more. There were more. Okay. Let's go straight to the code. Oops. Uh, I have already set up um, a TypeScript application. Uh, it's just a TypeScript application. It's just a bunch of files with a, in a TS extension and uh, a tsconfig.json file. I don't. Uh, since we have uh, little time, I've already set up the application, so um, you don't have to worry about setup. Um, let's start with strong typing, which is the one of the most important feature of TypeScript. And let's say var x string. As you see, I have declared a variable, and I say, hey, it's a string. When I say, yep, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, everyone is able to read? Okay. I'm saying x equals hello. And that's wor and that works fine, but when I say, you see the red squiggle here, it's telling me one is not assignable to a type string. So you have this compile time checking, which uh, which enables you to see your errors. You immediately see the, um, the errors you are you have in your code. It works for functions. Mm. Okay. Okay. Very, very simple function. I can function and say and that's okay. I can even write something like this and that's perfectly acceptable. It's JavaScript. It, we are writing TypeScript code, but it's JavaScript. We are, it's no, um, you are not forced to use the types. It's up to you. But if I say that I want first name to be a string and last name another string, as soon as I write, the ID invokes the compiler and the compiler say, hey, one is not correct. So I have to change. Sorry. And now everything's correct. Now the compiler tells there are no more errors. Another thing that is quite interesting and is offered by the TypeScript compiler is autocompletion. For instance, I say date. Here there are there is a red squiggle which tells me, hey, this method takes two takes three parameters, you're only giving two. So I can say new date. It's my birthday. So we have a definition. Uh, the compiler gives a definition of all the possible properties and method of the uh, date object. So I can say today's string, for instance. And that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. You can have classes, you can have whatever you want. This is just a small example of, of how the strong typing works. You have uh, control all, uh, over all the code. You have control, you can, uh, the compiler tells you every error you do. So you are able to uh, easily find errors at compile time. 
Who loves it? Mm, too few. I hope much more. Uh, okay. Now, strong typing is just one of the of the features of uh, TypeScript. The other one is the ability to use ECMAScript si 6 and 7 features in your code. And I want to focus on uh, just uh, a few of them. I will talk about uh, arrow functions. I will talk about async await. Who knows about async await feature? Hmm. Who doesn't know what it is? All of you know. Okay. And we'll see how to use them in uh, using TypeScript. And uh, um, if you have time, we'll, tr uh, we'll take a look at decorators. All of you know decorators? OK. We have about 15 minutes. Maybe we can do it. OK, let's forget about strong typing. And let create, uh, uh, let's create a class. Now I'm, gonna, I'm going to create a class which um, uh, query the Wikipedia uh, API and, retars and returns the result of this, uh, of this query. And I'm going to show the result. Let's start creating the class. So export class Wikipedia service. And say we have a get result myth. Okay. Okay. I will use uh, fetch, which is a library. Uh, import fetch from node fetch. Okay. And I'll say return fetch it takes a query parameter and then I say dot it the fetch me dot returns a promise and then I say function response And then return response dot JSON query result. Okay, so I'm querying the Wikipedia API, wait for the response, and then I cast the response to a query result object. I cast the, uh, the JSON that, the that is returned by the API to the query result object. So my get results method accepts a, a query parameter of type string and returns a, promises, a promise of query result. I want to add a, a bit of complexity. Say you have a public property, success counter, and uh, I want to in increment it each time uh, the I make a query. So, success counter, sorry, this dot, oops, oops, this doesn't work. Okay. Typical. <laughs> and now self. <coughs> Works. Okay, now, back to the main class. Here I import the module, import Wikipedia service from uh, types. Forgot curly braces. Okay. Service dot. I have auto completion, you see, because the compiler the compiler gives me the all the options available. It's not the ID, it's the compiler. I say I want to know everything about Titanic, and then 
uh, function result just console.log result okay pretty simple now if if I didn't anything wrong okay here is the result I just asked asked for two results from the uh, two objects from the um, Wikipedia API, so that's why I see just two objects. So, every, everything works. Who, think, who thinks I have written too much code? <laughs> okay, let's start simplifying. The first thing I want to simplify is this. This is these are this is the arrow function uh, feature of ECMAScript 6. So in TypeScript I can already use it. In thi this way, I have simplified. Um, I have just simplified a bit the code, but I can do better. This dot success counter plus plus. This time, I didn't I didn't have to declare var self equals this. And uh, I didn't use self here. I just used this because the arrow function used the same context of this of this invoking function. So here, this is equal to the Wikipedia service instance, and uh, in this scope, uh, this is uh, still the Wikipedia service instance. So fat arrow are different, are very different from the. Um, from the callback, because of because of this uh, of the this keyword, it has a different scope. So we are simplifying the code. Once again, who thinks I'm still writing too much code? <laughs> okay, so arrow function, we can do better than this. async await who doesn't know what I'm writing what I what I'm doing all of you know this pattern great so I'm just making this method async and then saying wait for this method to execute for the fetch method to execute when it when it's finished when uh, I had the result from the Wikipedia API then increment success counter and uh, return um, return the promise. So we are basically um, writing the same thing as before, but with less code. And that is why I love TypeScript because uh, it's pretty easy using TypeScript to create things like this. If I if I'm going to execute the code again, F5. Still the same result. So, same result, much less code. Okay, the last thing I want I want to show you are uh, um, decorators. How many of you um, knows what decorators are? Okay, pretty solid experience. Uh, decorators are um, essentially function that execute code before your uh, class constructor, before uh, your method execute, uh, before a property is accessed, and uh, is a way to um, to execute code before these things happens. A decorator is essentially a function, nothing more. So I created a class decorator. I already have the code because uh, 
we have five minutes, so no, um, we are uh, on a tight schedule, as I said. And uh, let's let's make a very simple example. Sometimes you want a method of your classes to be obsolete. You still want it to be there, but because uh, there's a lot of refactoring to do if you want to uh, remove that method. So you just say, hey, this method is obsolete. Um, use it, uh, but it, it will you can use it, but it will be removed in the in the future. And we don't and uh, all the logic stands in the decorator. So let's start with a simple example. Here I'm creating a function. A decorator is, the, is just a function which takes an object which can be on a, of uh, any type. In this case, I'm mm, creating uh, a decorator for a function. And a decorator for a function accepts an an, um, a variable of type object, of type any, which can be any object, uh, which is the object that contains the method I'm decorating. And property key is just the name of the method. Of course, you can call it whatever you like. Then, in types, uh, import obsolete from decorator. And here, I can say, sorry, obsolete. Now, what happens? Oops. What happens? It happens that when I run, uh, when I run the get results method, the code in the obsolete function is invoked before my method. So, stop. I run again. Hey, this method this method is obsolete. Okay. Sometimes we have to pass parameter to the uh, obsolete, to the decorator. So let's say we want to send a custom message. I can say, use the new get results method. Okay, it's just a message. The compiler tells me, uh, hey, there is not um, an obsolete decorator with this signature. So, essentially, I'm creating a decor uh, decorator factory. Function, obsolete. And I return the function. But this time, the message Okay, console.log message. Now, the compiler no longer complains. Let's just complain about this semicolon. If I run again and go to the console, use the new get results method. Here is the string I passed to the factory decorator. We have just a couple of minutes. So, um, here, here is another decorator, which uh, is called cache. I'm not, going, mm, I'm not going to use it. I'm just going to describe what it does. A decorator function, um, yes, a decorator which de that decorates a function can um, return a value or can modify the descriptor of the function. It's a third parameter here that you can use. The, fir the, the first two parameters are mandatory. The third one is optional. I, I am changing, using the descriptor.value, I am changing the function that will be invoked after, the, um, after the my decorator has executed. So I'm saying it's called cache. Um, 
the new function that is going to be executed after my uh, cache decorator is executed will check if there is already a value in the cache for the query I did over Wikipedia API. If there is the value, if we have a value in cache, return the cache original value of descriptor.value. In this way, uh, I can cache object, and my method, my original method, wouldn't even know that there is a cache behind. So um, using, decorator, the using decorators in this way can be uh, very, very powerful. And uh, as, I, as I was saying, uh, changing the value, uh, you can change the whole function that is going to be executed. And your original function doesn't even know that there is a cache. So if you use wisely the decorators, you can create powerful feature for your code. Now, it's time. I finished. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this session. Enjoy the show. <laughs> <laughs>